we're thinking about what songs we, we think about a lot of things. Think about what songs we like, what songs that we would enjoy doing. We try to think about what songs we think other people might enjoy hearing and what they might like to sing along to. But most importantly, I think about how I want us to do songs that God wants us to do. Songs that are going to speak to somebody in that moment, in that day, for something they're going through. Because that's part of it. We need to sing and worship God and hear stuff about stuff that speaks to us and that brings us closer to Him and appreciate our relationship with Him. And this song, I heard a long time ago um, when it came out, and I always thought it was a really pretty song. I really liked it. And honestly, every time I sang it in the car, I would always cry and get choked up over it. I was like, I don't know if I could ever sing this in church because I don't know if I can get through it. And then a couple weeks ago, we started our um, ladies' Bible study on Tuesday nights. And at the end, April was talking about how we all have scars. Is true. We've all been through stuff, stuff that we're, we might not be proud of or ashamed of, stuff that maybe other people have done to us, stuff that has scarred us. And scars aren't a pretty thing, but we shouldn't be afraid of them. We should be thankful for them because they tell a story. They tell of what we've come through, what we've been through, and most importantly, what God has done for us, what he's brought us out of. Just like his scars on his hands and his feet, they show what he did for us to deliver us from our sin and one day have a home with him. So hopefully I won't cry through it this time, um, but um, sing through it with us and I hope it touches your heart.
God works as we uh, each week as we um, uh, work towards playing the service. And I love it when we don't even talk about things, but they tie in so perfectly with what uh, we're going to be speaking about today. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Another instance for that is as I begin prepping for the service this week, somebody kept popping in my mind of a story that they told because it ties in so perfectly with what we're going to talk about today. So I called him and asked if he would give our testimony this morning. So um, I want Gary to come on up. Gary and his wife, they've been faithful since our opening day in September. And uh, I can't wait for you to hear how God worked in his life. And we'll tie that in later with our service of how God will work in all of our lives. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my wife and I were married in 1999. And in uh, 2002, or 2003, after the birth of our second child, we, uh, we started our own cleaning business. And for the first 12 years of that, it was, it was great. It was awesome. Um, in 2015, God, uh, we felt like God was telling us to do something else. And we didn't know what. So she went on the computer and did all the search engines kind of thing. And the first two things that popped up on every site that we saw was house care. We don't know what house parenting is, but it's you go to a children's home and you are the parent to the kids that are in your house. You help train them, you help raise them, you help supply their needs, you just love on them, you teach them life skills. Uh, I did not want to do it. I am I am born and raised in Charlotte. Uh, did not want to go. At the time, my my grandmother was uh, nearing the end, and I did not. And I promised my grandfather when he passed away that I would take care of her till she passed away. And uh, I didn't want to go. I was, I was like, no, God, I, I don't want to do it. Tanya was sold out from day one. So I, I was a stubborn one. Uh, over, this was in August of 2015. For the next couple of weeks, I, I tried God. God told us to try him, test him. And he continued to prove to me that this is what I needed to do. And every time I asked him to do something, he would do it. Uh, the last thing I asked him to do was, I said, three people have got to tell me exactly these words. Do you have to go to Florida? And within a 30-minute time frame, three people told me, you need to go to Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, so the day before we went, uh, that night, and I shared this with the guys who were meeting the other night, uh, God took me to the woodshed that night. It was, you know, this is not about you. This is not about what your feelings are. I understand your feelings, but it's not about you. It's about what I want you to do. Uh, so after a lot of crying and a lot of, of going outside and yelling at trees and doing everything I needed to do, God took me to the woodshed to love me. Uh, so we left. We left in September of 2015. We packed our business up. We didn't sell it. We closed it because something in our minds was like, We went to Florida. We crammed six weeks of six months of training into six weeks, which was brain overload. If you've ever been in college, it's brain overload. Books this much you had to take. Anyway, we uh, we completed that, and in November of 2015, we became official house parents in, in Tallahassee, Florida. We were able in the 18 months that we were there to deal with 20 of the awesome kids that you ever met in your life. Uh, not only did we help them. Not did they help us, but God, God showed me why he sent me there. There was one kid in particular that he sent me there for, I know. And uh, like I told the guys the other night, uh, I know there's, there's going to be kids in heaven because I answered God's call to go to Florida. Uh, in January of 2017, God said, okay, you kept your end of the bargain. I'm going to send you back home. So we came back home. We, uh, in February... 2017, day one, we started our business back, and in the first three months of our business, God doubled our business, um, and in a on April 29th, uh, my grandmother took her last breath, and God promised that I would be there for her. I was there. Not only was I there, but I was the only one in the room with her when she passed away. Amen. So it's just a lesson of, of Get over your stubbornness. Do what God tells you to do, and he will bless you. You won't see it at first, but you will see it eventually. And I, it's just a, an experience I would never, never trade. This is one that uh, was near and dear to our hearts from the very start. Kind of, and I feel like it's our overall. 
overwhelming overarching theme here. Um, so you should be familiar with it, so I want to hear you guys sing it out loud and proud. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Ephesians 
chapter 3. Ephesians 3, we are going to finish the third chapter this morning. Um, we've been studying through this book. We, we, I've said it every week, but it's important for us. Remember the first three chapters, Paul was just basically describing to the church what they have in Jesus and a reminder of that so that they will live the way that they should live because of that. And that's what he spends chapters 4 through 6 talking about. It's how we should live in response to knowing what we have in him. But he ends this third chapter with a, a beautiful prayer. Uh, and it, I said it earlier, it taught me so much about my own prayer life this week and, and the way we should be praying in our outlook. And I can't wait to, to share it with you um, this morning. And so with that being said, we, we talked last week about Paul started the prayer in chapter 3, verse 1. He started the prayer, but after he started the prayer, he went to this big parenthetical phrase that was covered chapters 2, verse, or excuse me, verses 2, verse through verse 13. It's like he made a pause. So he started the prayer in chapter 1, but then he went, oh yeah, by the way, and then he goes in this long phrase, again, reminding them of who they are and what they have in Jesus, the inheritance they have, the, the security that they have in him. And so when we get into verse 14, he goes back and says, for this reason. You see chapter 3 verse 1 opens up with for this reason and then he remembers oh let me get back to the prayer I was praying for the church in verse 14. And so let's read that together this morning. Uh, if you wouldn't mind standing and honor the word of God. If you don't have your Bibles you can see on the screen. It will be, it will be there for you um, as well. But let's read this together. For this reason Paul says I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints <clears throat> what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what your word teaches us. I thank you, Lord, that it's alive. And I thank you for this study that we've been going through, Lord, and, and how much you've taught uh, me through this study, Father. And I pray Lord, that others have, have, have learned things that they've applied to their life. I thank you for uh, the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the reminder that we've had these last five or six weeks about that. So, Lord, be with us this morning. Lord, I know that everyone in here has things going on in their life, but I pray that right now you will just help them to clear those things. Father, just, uh, please, I pray for the distractions of the devil, Lord, that you'll bind him and not allow him to be in here this morning, that Lord, through your Holy Spirit, we will learn things today that we will apply to our life. And so, Father, be with us this morning, God. Lord, anything that I would want to say, please don't allow me to, but I pray that you will speak through the Spirit. And, Lord, I pray that you will help us to look at this passage and to learn. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for the wonderful worship that we've already had. Lord, help us to continue in worship of you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. If you look at Paul and, and, and the life of Paul, almost every recorded prayer that Paul gives us, he is praying for other people. He's not praying for himself, and that's the same thing that can be applied uh, to this passage here. And so there's three things I want us to see this morning through this prayer of Paul. One, that is Paul's attitude, his attitude. The second, we want to see his request, and finally, we want to see his praise. And so we're going to look at those three things this morning. The first one being in verses 14 and 15 is Paul's attitude as he goes to prayer. He says, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And there's two things that we see in Paul's attitude. And the whole thing that we're looking at this morning when we look at the life of Paul and we look at this prayer that he gives the church, these are things that can apply to our life as we go to prayer. These are reminders for us. There are some people in here that have the spiritual gift of prayer. I know that there's people in my life that when I have something going on, I always call them. It doesn't matter when, I always call them because I want them praying for me because 
for me, they had their spiritual, their prayer is on another level. But there's some of us in here, and this is, I'm speaking to myself first, that prayer is a more difficult thing. I love studying the word. I love being there for people. But sometimes my prayer life can be more void than it should be. And so, as I said, this taught me so much this week. And, and so as we look at this, I want you to think about your prayer life. I want you to think about when you go to prayer and see if it's, if it's similar to this or see what we can pull out of this. The first thing we see is Paul's attitude. His attitude. Look in verse 14a. And the first thing with his attitude we see is posture. He says, for this reason, again, going back to verse 1, tying it all back in together, what does he say? He says, I bow my knee. I bow my knee. In Paul's day, uh, it was court etiquette that you would bow your knee before you approach the throne. I want to make this clear. I'm not saying right now that unless you get on your knees in prayer, God doesn't hear you. I'm not saying that. Some of you, if you got down on your knees to pray, you wouldn't be able to get back up. All right? I'm not saying that at all. But it's Paul's attitude toward that. It's Paul's attitude toward that. Why did he do that? One, it's a sign of submission. Paul is saying when he bows his knee, he is recognizing that he's in the presence of someone greater than him. You see, sometimes I think when we pray, we put God on our level and we just throw it out there with everything else. Hey, just like I'm talking to a friend, we forget the reverence, we forget the holiness, we forget that we're praying to someone who is much greater than I am. Our attitude when we pray should be, I am a nothing coming to someone who's everything. And I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your guidance. You are the creator of the universe. You are the savior of of my soul. I am coming to you. I think when we pray, it's a good reminder for us to think about the prayers that God's answered in our life. When we come to him, we're coming with confidence. Why? Because look at what he's already done in our life. Remember who he is. Remember what he's done. Psalm 95 verse 6 says this, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. You see, Paul showed reverence before he went to the Lord in prayer. I'm not going to get into it because we've talked about it a, month, a bunch, but, but Paul is the most of any of us. I mean, he's the most. God used him for so much. God used him to do, accomplish so much. Even before he was a believer, he was accomplished. If anybody had the right to be arrogant, to be prideful, it would be Paul. If anybody had the right to say, God, we're on the same team. I feel like I'm carrying a lot of the load. I need you to step up and do this too. What does he do? No, he remembers who he is. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. And church, we have to remember that apart from Jesus Christ in our life, we're nothing. And so when he went to prayer, he went in a prayer of submission. You notice he didn't say to God, he didn't say, God, this is what has to happen. He didn't say to God, God, I know what's best. What did he do? He humbly bowed himself before him. He humbly bowed himself before the second thing we see is in the second part of that verse, he goes, I bow my knees, and he says, before the Father. That's the key word I want to remember, but look at verse four, thir, uh, 15. It talks more about it. For the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He said, for the Father. You see, he, he not only bowed down as a sign of submission, but, but, but also uh, when, when bowing the knees in these days, it was the sign of this intense emotion, and Paul was praying with intense emotion. You think about that. You think about Jesus in the garden. Was Jesus standing, walking around? No, Jesus was on his knees praying. Jesus was sweating blood, saying, if it be your will, let this cup pass, but not mine will be done, but yours. You think about Daniel when facing persecution for worshiping God. What was he doing? He was on his knees in prayer. It was an emotional prayer, and Paul is on his knees in prayer with this emotion, and he says, I'm praying to my Father, to my Father. If you look at the life of Jesus, he always used this in prayer. And when he taught others, he used this same word, the Father. It's such a personal term. You see, we, we, we need to go to him with honor. We need to go to him with respect. But we can go to him treating him as a Father. He's loving. He's accepting. He's concerned. You think about in your life, I think about in mine, I can always approach my dad with anything. No matter how bad I've messed up, no matter how bad of a hole that I'm in, whatever my problem may be, I don't have to go different to my dad about it. 
I can go to him with confidence. I can go to him knowing that he's not going to judge me, knowing that he's going to love me, and knowing that he's going to do everything he can to help me. I don't have to say, oh, my gosh, what's, how, how's he going to react? I don't have to put on a show. When you, you, you have your parents, you have those people in your life, when, when they call you and you say hello and they say, what's wrong? They can just tell in your voice. That's how my dad is. Right? You can have those emotions with them. He knows. He loves. It's unconditional. And so Paul's coming to him. Paul's coming to him. He's on his knees, and he's saying, Father, what a great reminder. You might be in here today and say, well, that's great that you have great memories with your dad. I don't. That's great that you can say that about your dad. I can't. I didn't know my dad, or my dad was a terrible person. I didn't want to be around him. You see, the greatest attack that Satan has put on America, on the world today, is the attack of fathers. He's taken them out of homes. He's made them to where they're not a part of a child's life. And we see a generation growing up without that, and we see that there's a lack of control there. So Satan attacks the father. And so I want to tell you this. If that's you, if that's you this morning, you say, I don't have the best relationship with that. Jesus has given you access to the ultimate father through dying on the cross for your sins. You say, I haven't experienced that in my life. I don't have that kind of relationship. Well, if you have a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, you have access to the heavenly father. You have access to the Father who will never mess up. As great as I think of my dad, and I love my dad, he's going to mess up. Guess what? Jesus never messes up. Guess what? Our Heavenly Father never messes up. And so Paul comes. And he comes before he even opens up into a prayer, not even a prayer for himself, but a prayer for other people. Before he even opens up, he has the right attitude. How flippantly do we go into prayer? How flippantly do we go into prayer in our lives? Oh, about to eat, smell the food. God, thank you. Right? Something's wrong. I need help. God, where are you? Oh, I'm in a trial. I don't like it. God, why aren't you doing something? How flippantly do we pray to the creator of the universe? You see, the first thing we have to understand before we go to prayer is we have to have the right attitude. We have to have the attitude of submission. We have to have the attitude of reverence, and we have to have the attitude of the personal father that we have in our life through God. And so Paul says in verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And so Paul goes to prayer. He, he, he says that he's addressing the father. He, he comes in submission to him. And then the th second thing I want us to see, not only his attitude, I want to see his request. His request, and we'll see those in verse 16 through 19. Paul says in verse 16, he says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. The first we request that we see of Paul is that we would be strengthened, that the church would be strengthened through his spirit. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Listen. Do you want to live a life of strength? I believe that every one of us would say that we want to live a life of strength, of power in the Lord, but we're not willing to do what it takes. Or we look for that strength elsewhere. The only way that we're going to get strength to live the life that we should is through God and the Holy Spirit in our lives. Acts 1 8 says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all to Judea and to the uh, Judea and to the and Samaria and the end of the earth. But here's the problem: we want that strength, but we battle. We battle. Paul says this in Romans uh, chapter seven, verse twenty-three, uh, twenty-two and twenty-three. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. He goes on in chapter 8 to say this, starting in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot 
God. You see, the problem with us is we say, yes, I want to live this life of strength. Paul's praying for the church, give them this life of strength. But here's what we have to do. We have to win the constant battle that we have in our lives with our flesh. We have to win that battle. Church, we can't uh, go along and, and say, I want this, I want this, but not do what it takes to get it. You see, we have to constantly be fed. We have to constantly spend time, and we have to seek the Spirit's will for every aspect in our life. That's how we'll be strengthened. It doesn't happen overnight. It won't happen overnight. That's too easy. It takes commitment. It takes a desire to want to grow, to spend time in His Word, to allow yourself to grow in His flesh, to try to overcome sin in your life. You see, what we do is we pray for these things. God, fill me with your strength. But then we go out and live how we want to live. God, grant me strength in my life. Give me strength through the Spirit. But then you do nothing in your own life to help make that change. It's like going to McDonald's getting a Big Mac and a large fry and a large Coke and two apple pies, and then you pray, God, just bless this nutritional meal that I'm about to eat and, and help it more just to turn into vitamins on the way down and to, to make me healthier. And it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You see, in our life, we have to submit. In our life, we have to continue to feed ourselves so that we can be strengthened. We have to continue to allow ourselves to grow in God's Word. You say, well, how does that happen? It's not easy, but how it happens is through spending time in God's Word, through learning who He is, through seeing His law, through seeing how He wants us to live our life, and not only applying that to life, but trying in every aspect of our life to give Him control. Paul asked for the church to be strengthened. He knew to overcome all that they would face, that they needed to be strengthened. And so, Paul, that they would have this strength in the life. You see, the more that we grow spiritually in our lives, the sin will decrease. The desire for sin will become less. It will never go away. It will always be a struggle. But the more that we grow in Christ, the more that we allow the Holy Spirit to have access in our life, the more that that happens, the less we'll struggle. And so Paul just said, I, I pray that they are growing in their spirit. Help them to grow in their spirit. And the second thing that he said, not only be strengthened through the spirit, but this ties into this next point. But let Christ dwell in their heart. Look at 17, the first part of uh, verse 17. It says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That word for dwell there means to inhibit a house. It's not merely like to be a house guest, but to just say, hey, can I come over? And you come over and you just put your stuff out and you hang your pictures on the wall. That's your house. That's what Paul's saying right there. It has the connotation uh, in, in this passage that we, we can't have Christ just hang out in our hearts. He has to be home in our hearts. He has to be like a family member. Listen, we can't have that uh, until our inner person submits to the strengthening of the Spirit. John MacArthur said that when we, we have this, when we have a relationship with Jesus, but we're not trying to live for him. He's, he said that we're not making Jesus anything more than a tolerated visitor. You see, we have to let him come in to our lives. We have to let him clean out the sin in our heart. The problem is we don't let him clean the sin out of our lives. We, we're hoarders. We want to hold on to things. We want to hold on to our sins. We want to hold on to our pleasures. We want to hold on to our worldly, <coughs> excuse me, our worldly desires. You see, Christ, or, or, or Paul said, listen, you, you, you have to allow the Spirit to strengthen you. And as, as you're strengthened, guess what? It's cleaning that stuff out of your heart. It's getting rid of that sin. It's getting rid of all those struggles that you have. And you have to allow him to do that. So you have to let Christ dwell in your heart. We can't split Jesus on Sunday, then not Monday through Saturday do what we want. We can't have Jesus on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we give in to the sins of the world. We have to let him abide in our heart. We have to give him control. Paul knew that this church would face challenges. Paul knew that this was only the beginning of the test that they would have in their life. But if they didn't have strength in their heart, if they didn't allow Jesus to dwell, to be number one in their lives, he knew that they would never overcome the, the battles that they would face. 
How many of us as believers never overcome the battles that we face because we're never fully willing to submit our life to Jesus Christ? We want Jesus in our life because I want to know, and I want my family to know that if I die, I'm going to heaven. I don't want to think about hell. I don't want to worry about hell. But everything else I'm holding on to, you see, we don't submit. We don't trust him with our life. We don't trust him and allow him to dwell. We don't allow him to make a, 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 a home in our hearts. We don't allow him to make home in our life. We always make him feel uncomfortable because we've got to keep the things of the world in there as well. Paul goes on, and this is just a continuation of this, but in 17, the second part of 17 through 19, he says, also, I pray that they know the love of Christ. Look at the second part of verse 17. It says that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of of God. He prayed that they would understand the love of Christ in their life. Why? It does two things. If you understand the love of Christ in your life, it makes you to love him more. And secondly, as you grow, as you continue to grow, it makes you display that love to others. You see, if we allow Jesus into our life, if we allow him control in our life, if we allow him to come in, we follow his word, we spend time with him, we're trying to grow, we're trying to overcome through him sin in our life. As that happens, we take more on of the characteristics of Jesus. We want to live like him. And who was the ultimate example of love? It was Jesus. He's our ultimate example of love. John 13 34 says this. It said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And also, you also are to love one another. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about the fruits of the Spirit. But what is the first one? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against things there is no law. There is no law. You see, love is not something that we add to our Christian life. Love is at the foundation of our Christian life. You see, the foundation of our Christian life, the foundation of our walk, the foundation of our salvation is the love that Jesus showed us by emptying himself, becoming of no reputation, taking on the form of a man, coming in the form of a bondservant, and, lightning, and submitting himself to death, even to death on the cross. That's love. That's the greatest example of love that can ever be shown to us. And so as Paul prays, these requests that he makes, what spoke to me is, is a continuation. If you do one, you're going to start to do the other. If you do the other, you're going to start to do the other. If we allow ourselves to be strengthened by the Spirit, that means that we are, honor, we are wanting to honor Christ in our life, that we're being dedicated to spending time with him through his word, through listening to messages, through singing praises to him, through prayer, through trying to be submissive in our life and turn away from sin in our life. As that happens, we allow Christ to dwell more in our life. We're allowing him to clean the sin in our life because we don't want to be a part of that. And as that happens, we take on more of who Jesus is. And what do we do? We can't help but show love to everyone else. If we want to be effective as a church, the greatest way is to show the love of Jesus in our life. Our tagline is love in action. Is love who we are, or is love we got to put on when we do an activity, or we do an outreach? Are we allowing ourselves to grow in our relationship with Jesus? Are we daily trying to grow so that he takes more in our life, so that he cleans us out, so that we can display more of him? And love is just a natural thing that we do. It made me think of the story of the Good Samaritan. You've all heard that story, but what happened? Two religious people passed by. Not only did they pass by, they, they didn't pass by and say, are you okay? They didn't pass by and, and do a thumbs up. What they do, they, they literally cross the street so they wouldn't have to be close. And that's religious people. You see, we can know a lot about God. We can come in here and fill ourselves with knowledge every week. But if we're not letting him take root in our life, which we'll talk about in a minute, if we're not allowing him to grow us closer to him, we're not going to display love. That comes from him. 
And what happened? The good Samaritan, what? He, he not only gave of his time, he gave of his money, he gave of everything. He gave his inconvenience. Why? Because that's who he was. And so Paul prayed for this church. Man, let them grow in the spirit. Let them be strengthened by that. Not, not only let them be strengthened by that, let, let Christ continue to dwell in their heart, make his home in their heart. Not just be a guest, make his home in their heart. Why? Because then let them see the love of Christ. You see, we've talked about this a bunch, so I don't want to uh, keep going over it, but we, we look at the love that Jesus displayed for us, and we gladly accept that, and we gladly take that, but we don't display that to the world. We don't show that to other people. Finally, as, as we close this morning, not only did he have, uh, the, we look at his attitude, we look at his request, let's look at his praise. Verse 20 and 21, this is my, uh, this is, I love this. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work within you. Listen, before we even talk about this, I know that everyone in here, if we called you up individually, if we called you up as couple, I know that each one of us are going through different things. I know that there's people in here that have prayed for something for, for, for years and years, and God hasn't answered that prayer yet. I know there's people in here that are going through trials right now that you're saying, why can't God listen? Why isn't he doing anything about it? I know that there's people in here that life is great, and so you're saying, God, allow that continue. This should speak to all of us. This should speak to all of us as a great reminder. You might be in here in your spiritual walk, and you're like, Stephen, everything that you're saying is me. I battle. I want to do right, but I always give over to the bad. I want to do right, but I mess up all the time. I want to do right, but I feel like even if I try, I mess up, so it's better not to try. Stop listening to Satan in your life and listen to what's said right here. This will speak to every one of us. Look at verse 20. It says, now to him, talking about God, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. I want to stop right there and I want to look at a few words that are in that verse. And just as a good reminder to us, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. Well, look at that word ask. I want you to have confidence when you bow your head to him today to know this. There is nothing that you can ask them, him that is out of his range. There is nothing that you can say to him that he'll say, I can't do that. You see, right? I, we all are friends in here. We're family. If I had a need, I could go to all of you, and I believe that you would do everything that you would could to help me. If you came to me, I would do everything that I could to help you. But guess what? I'm going to ask you something or you're going to ask me something that is out of our range. <coughs> There's going to come a time when people can't help you. Right? It might be that you're praying for peace in a storm right now. It might be that you're praying to overcome sin. It might be that you're praying for God to bless your life. It might be that you're praying for salvation. Guess what? I can't give you salvation. There's people in here that are a lot better than me. They can't give you salvation. The only person who can give you salvation is Jesus Christ. Amen. When you're going through a storm, we can be there to comfort each other, and we should be there to comfort each other, to carry you while you're down. That's the kind of church we're going to be. We will carry you while you're down, but guess who's going to pull you out of the storm? It's going to be God. When you're struggling in your life, when you're struggling to overcome sin, I can encourage, I can encourage you, but I can't give you the strength to overcome that sin. And so when you pray, pray with confidence. Pray with confidence knowing that he can do everything you ask. I do discipleship with, with a group on Tuesday nights. And this Tuesday night we're talking about the characteristics of God. And we, we talked about uh, his, that, that he is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. There's nothing we can ask that is greater than him. Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus looked up at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Luke 1, 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. So when you pray, have confidence knowing that there's nothing that you can ask that will catch him off guard. Look at that verse again. He says, able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. I want to look at that word, uh, or all that we ask or think. I want to look at that word think. I remember when I was a kid in church and people would raise their hand and they'd give prayer requests. People would give unspoken prayer requests. 
I used to think that was a bunch of crock. I'd get so mad, like, pray for whatever's going on. I mean, how are we supposed to pray for that? What are we supposed to do? But God's word right here says it. All that we ask or think. You know, you might have thoughts, dreams, uh, hopes that you don't let out because people might think you're crazy. You might be going through something that you don't want to let out because people will judge you. You might be scared about something that you don't want to let out because you don't want other people to be scared. Have confidence knowing that he knows what you think. Not only can he grant what you ask, he can grant what you think. You might have secret desires for uh, holiness, for happiness, for fulfillment. He knows those thoughts, and he's able to fulfill them. Psalms 139, verse 2. You know when I sit down and you know when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Let's look at the rest of that verse and we'll work backwards as we look at that verse. Not only does he know what we, he can do what we ask, what we think, but look back. He says far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. You see, he has no restrictions. All that we ask or think. It doesn't say right there, listen, you, you're, you're granted, he's not a genie in the bottle. Here's your two wishes. If those come true, you're done for the month. He can do it whenever, however he sees fit. He doesn't have a quota. We look back one more word. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly. Abundantly. I want to talk about this word for a little bit. The definition of abundant means uh, it's a present and great quantity, more than adequate, over sufficient. You see, he's not able to answer our prayers. He's not able to answer what we ask. He's not able to only answer what we think. He's not able to answer all of those prayers whenever he wants to. He answers them abundantly. You see, we have to have faith when we're praying, as you're praying, that I'm, I'm praying this every day. Don't give up. Don't lose faith. Know that God's going to answer that in his timing, in his own way. And when he answers it, it might blow you away the answer he gives. How many of you can look back in your life and you say, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and God didn't answer and I doubted and I doubted and I doubted. But then he answered and then he blew me away with how he answered that prayer. Amen. He answered it in ways I couldn't even imagine. I have a great example with Paul. Paul wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to be with those people. He said in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 of Romans, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, talking to the Romans, always in my prayer, asking that somehow by God's will I may uh, now at last succeed in coming to you. He wanted to go. He prayed that he could go. Guess what? Eventually God let him go, but he let him go in chains, under arrest by Nero. He looked at that and he said, well, how's that God abundantly answering your prayers because he wanted to go? Why didn't he just let him go? He, he, he let him go, but he was in prison when he did it because it allowed Paul to write the book of Romans. While he was in prison, he was able to write the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Philippians 1.12, Paul understood. He said, I want you to know, brother, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, he prayed to go to Rome, but what if God had just let him go to Rome? We wouldn't have all these books of the New Testament that we study, that we learn from. You see, God had a plan, and it was bigger than Paul's plan. It was bigger than Paul's prayer. God abundantly answered that prayer request. Were there times where Paul wondered, why am I in prison? I'm sure that there was. But his faith saw him through, and his faith also allowed him to see what God's bigger plan was. That's why I had Gary give his testimony this morning. Man, at Bible study, and I've heard it a couple times now, he talks about it, which I love because it shows you how real it is in his life. But at, at our Bible study, when he talked about that, and as I've studied this abundantly, I couldn't get past it because, you know what? He knew that he needed to go. And he tested God. Should I go? Should I go? And God continued to answer the test. But some of the reasons for Gary doing that was he wanted to be here for his grandmother. He wanted to be here. He's thinking about those things. So Gary eventually just had to have faith, and he stepped out on faith. And what did God do? God abundantly answered his prayer. You say, how? Because over 20 kids are going to be in heaven because of what he did. But guess what? God also brought them back, blessed their business like it's never been blessed, and he was able to be with his grandmother. That's an abundant answer to prayer.
in my life. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, God, you got to open this door for me. you got to open this door, God, you got to let me do something else. you got to open this door. And he never did for years. And I'm going, God, why? What have I done wrong? Who, who, wh why? Because he was still making me who he wanted. But when he answered my prayer, it was in ways I couldn't imagine. It was, he answered my prayer. He put people in my life. I'm talking about you guys. He put, he surrounded us. He gave us this great church. I never would imagine this. That's an abundant answer to prayer. That's an abundant answer. And how many times has God in your life abundantly answered your prayers? You see, he is faithful. We're not. Amen. He never moves. We move. And Paul knew who God was. He knew, let me pray these things for these people. Let them understand. Because if they understand, if they realize who they have in you, if they realize what you'll do in their life, if they are willing to give up, if they're willing to give it over to you, this will blow the Ephesian church. It will blow the Ephesians away. It will blow this church in Ephesus. It will make their spiritual walk like it's never been before. You see, that is the power that he has that Paul's talked about through these first three chapters. The power that he has that is at work in us. You see, what he does is he comes into your life and he changes you. You think of Zacchaeus. You think a tax collector who lived to rob others, who lived to steal from his own people. You think of, of his life, and you think that he spent time with Jesus, and what did he do? He went and repaid. Not only did he repay, he gave them more. You see, money was his God, but when he met the true God, he didn't want anything to do with it. He wanted to be about Jesus. Amen. You think of Paul. He goes on the road persecuting people, persecuting not people, Christians, on the road to that, to all of a sudden he writes the majority of the New Testament. Why? Because he saw that his God was bigger than the God that he served. So here's what I want to ask you as we close today. What God are you serving? Are you not tired in your life of coming up shorthanded? Are you not tired of seeking happiness? Are you not tired of looking for something to give you this joy, this fulfillment that you have in your life? You've tried relationships. You've tried money. You've tried position. You've tried all these things, and you keep coming back to the same spot. You know why? Because there's one ultimate God that we can serve, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And not only did he die for us, but he loved us enough that God sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. He loved us enough that he forgives us when we mess up. Guys, when are you going to get tired of playing Christian? This is a powerful prayer that Paul gave us. Because it's all about growth. It's all about growth. I, I am, um, I don't know what you call them. I'm just bad at growing things. I don't know what that's called. Um. I, for, we've lived in our house for five years. And for five years, I've tried to grow grass in my backyard. <laughs> and I've spent money on it. If you go to my house now, you'll see I've got stuff down. I look like I know what I'm doing. But come March or April, I'll look like an idiot again because it'll be dead, I'm sure. But I've learned. I've studied. You know what? When I put that seed down, I had to make sure that the soil was right. I have to check the temperature. I've got to make sure if it gets to a certain heat, I've got to water my yard. My new morning routine, and some of you have seen me, so you can, you, you can attest to this truth. It's like seven or eight different sprinklers set up, and the hose is running through my yard. It looks like an interstate. Like it's, it's crazy. But I water my each section 20 minutes a day. And so I just sit out there with a chair. That's where I read my Bible, set my timer, switch hoses. It's a two-hour process in my day, every day. Why? Because I want that grass to grow. And I know this. I know if that grass isn't deeply rooted, if it's not deeply rooted, guess what's going to happen? As soon as it faces some adversity, as soon as it gets really hot or it gets really cold, what's going to happen? It's going to die. Why? Because it has to have a deep root system. And when you look at this passage, he says, I pray that they understand the love of Christ, the, the depth, width of it. You see, we've got to be firmly rooted in him. And how does that happen? That happens by us every day being intentional to do what we have for that root system to strengthen, to grow. Why? If we don't, then when we face a storm, when we face adversity, when we face a difficult time, guess what happens? Just like my grass dies, we just wither away. You know, those first three chapters have been very, here's what we have in Christ. And, and, and I believe 
with all my heart that we appreciate that. But but here's my question in closing. I've said it already. When are we going to stop playing Christian? When are we going to start living in what we have in Jesus? See, we get too controlled by what's going on in our life. We get too controlled by what's right in front of us. And we've got to get to a point where we say, you know what? I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to live by faith in God. I'm going to live by faith in what he's done in my life. Church, that's my challenge to you today. That's my challenge. You can bow your head and close your eyes. My challenge is this. Are you where you need to be in your walk? Are you, are you spending time trying to, to deeply root yourself in the Word of God? Are you spending time trying to grow in Him? Are you spending time in serious prayer? You say, that's a, that's a lot. Peter, that's a lot that you're asking right there. It is. And it's nothing that we're going to perfect immediately, but we need to have the desire that we want to try. We need to have the desire that we want to grow. You might be in here this morning and you can't be rooted firmly in Jesus Christ because you've never asked him to be the Lord of your life. You've never given yourself over to him. You've never said, God, I need you to be my Savior. That's you today. We've got men and women that would love to help you. Just answer any questions you may, you may have to help you through that process of knowing and understanding what it means to have a relationship with him. You think that you might be the only person that's struggling with that. Wednesday night, I'm teaching our teenagers this Wednesday. How do you know if you have a relationship with Jesus? Why? Because that's the biggest question that they have. And that may be you today. If that's you today, we don't want to do anything to embarrass you or anything. We just want to help you. We want to help you. But you've got to be willing. You've got to have the desire. You've got to want to. And so when no one's looking around this morning, I would ask, is there anyone in here this morning that says, you know what? I'm not sure if I have that relationship with Jesus. I would love for someone just to, to talk to me about that. Would you slip your hands up? All right. So I'm talking to believers. I want, to, I want to challenge you this morning. Look at Paul's attitude. Look at his request. Look at his praise. Look at the, the Jesus that you serve. Are you serving him in a worthy manner? Are you giving your all to him? And if you're not, it shows the grace that he has for us because he's let you be here today and he's given us another chance. So if you would be in here this morning you say, you know what, I... That's me right now. The Lord's convicted me of that. I just want to pray for you. If you would slip your hands up. Let me put them down. Thank you. There's hands in the room. And I want to pray, even for those who didn't raise your hand, I pray that in your life, that you're putting the Lord in the right position. And that's in the front. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, for this day that you've given us for your word, for the challenge of your word. I pray, Lord, that you will just be with those who raise their hands, first of all, Lord. Help them to seek help if they need it, Lord, or Lord, just give them the strength, Lord, to overcome what they need to in their life. Lord, give them the strength to put you in the right position. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise for that. I thank you, Father, for, for who you are. Thank you for loving us. I thank you for your word, Lord, for for each one of us. Help us not to just simply forget your word as we leave, but to, to, to meditate on it. Meditate on what we learned this morning, Lord, to apply it to our life. Lord, we'll give you the praise for that. We love you.